Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Please open your Bibles in, if you will, to First Chronicles chapters 16 and 17 for tonight as we continue our journey through the Word of God. Loving the Word of God, verse by verse. As I looked over these two chapters, I simply gave them the title, Thanksgiving and When the Lord Says No. Thanksgiving and when the Lord says no. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for drawing us here to this place. I thank you for the sweetness of your spirit, Lord, in, in worship and in praise. Thank you for meeting us there in that place. And now, Holy Spirit, I ask that you continue this night, that you would be the teacher. I pray that you would bring enlightenment to the Word. Because as much as we may study, as much as, much as we may look into the Word, it requires divine revelation to understand. And so, Holy Spirit, please bring divine revelation this night. For we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody says, Amen. 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 All right, we've been kind of like waiting for this moment here at the start of First Chronicles chapter 16, because David finally <coughs> gets the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Yeah. So it's like, hooray, 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 because David had tried to do a good thing the wrong way. And we saw how sometimes that can even happen in our own lives. We discussed that. We may have some grand idea, but if we don't do it according to God's order, then uh, you're not going to get blessed. So David actually leaves the ark. It was a very costly mistake to cost somebody their life. Uh, the whole nation was out to watch this grand thing happen, the ark of the covenant being moved to Jerusalem. God at the center of his people where he's supposed to be, but uh, what a colossal failure. Sometimes we'll have colossal failures too, but thank goodness God doesn't give up on us, does he? He doesn't pitch us out, throw us out. He never gives up. Amen on that one. Thank you, Lord. I'm yours. You, you, you got me in the deal, Lord. <laughs> so uh, I, I, he knows what he got too, doesn't he? And he still loves us. That's awesome about that, you know. Still, are we still your kids? Yes. Okay, good, Lord. So uh, David has three months, and during that three-month period of time, he goes to the Word of God. Smart going, David. David finds out that God has an order for moving the ark. As a matter of fact, through Moses, God even designated what families would be responsible for moving the ark. So David goes, the light bulb goes on. David calls out the priests, calls out the families that are in charge of moving the ark, finds out exactly what Moses said to do when you do so. And now David's ready. And so the end of the chapter last week, we saw David dancing. His wife, Michael, did not like it. Uh, but uh, then, uh, you know what? Some people don't get worship. And I personally don't get that, that they don't get it. Uh, if you come to church... And comes time for worship and you're looking at the bulletin or who else came or didn't come, you're missing the service. Amen. The service starts <laughs> right there in the place of worship. We should have a light at the front of the church. Now meeting God. Now meeting God, you know, as worship takes place. You know, that would be that'd be a smart thing to do. So uh, David's there and, and they're just about to pull into the uh, to where David has built a tent, had a tent built next to his beautiful <coughs> palace. We'll even talk about that tonight. So let's get to it, shall we? Let's see the ark successfully moved by the grace of God. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 1. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected. That's a tent. Then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. All right, Bible students, I'm sure you recall then the difference between a burnt offering and a peace offering, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I heard a cricket. <laughs> you know, <laughs> those Western scenes where the tumbleweed goes by, you know, and the, <laughs> the owl screeching. Anyway, it's exactly right there. The burnt offering was where the offering was completely consumed. You put the offering on the altar, and it is burnt to a crisp. There's nothing left of it. Uh, one of the uh, fellows here at church, uh, Jim Glenn, was saying that uh, this, last, uh, this last summer, he bought a huge uh, rack of ribs. 
And he put those on his brand new barbecue. He, you, he told you the story too. He put this, and it was an expensive rack of ribs too. And uh, I guess he didn't adjust it right because you know sometimes if there's enough grease, the fire catches. And he walked away for a little while, and when he comes back, his barbecue is completely consumed in this thing. He opens up the thing, gets the fire turned out, and there's the rack of ribs. He goes, but he touched the ribs. And they just disintegrated into nothing. <laughs> there was nothing left. <laughs> beautiful ribs. That is a burnt offering. <laughs> and we're supposed to put our lives on God's altar to be completely consumed. None of us. All of him. Not my way, but your way, oh God. Just if I got other plans and designs that don't match up with what God has for me, Lord, burn them to a crisp. I give myself wholly to you. And that, that was the burnt offering. But he also did peace offerings. I don't know if you remember peace offerings and what they meant. Wait, I'm waiting for another tumbleweed to go by. <laughs> no, the peace offering signified communion or fellowship with God. So here's the fun part about a peace offering. When you had a peace offering, uh, before it got burnt, when it was just juicy right, you pull it off of the sacrifice altar and you eat it. The vast majority of the peace offering was consumed by the people. So the thought is, is you're having a barbecue with God. So God says, why don't you come on over to my house and we'll have a barbecue. We'll call it a peace offering. We'll talk about celebrate. So they did that. So you, I want you to just really picture this beautiful day they're having. Verse 2. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings... He blessed the people in the name of the Lord. There's a key here. There's a principle here. Catch this. This is good for all of us because a lot of us want to be able to bless other people, don't we? We see how God blesses us. We think to ourselves, boy, it'd really be terrific if I could bless other people. Maybe we have some people in our lives that we know that have blessed us on a number of occasions. What allows that to take place within Christianity is the following. If you want to be a blessing to others, first, offer yourself as a burnt sacrifice. Second, have fellowship with God. And if you've got those two key components, the burnt offering, the peace offering, in your life, then you'll be able to be a blessing to others. And that's what David does as he blesses other people. Uh, great, awesome. Verse 3. Then he distributed to everyone. This is like a, this is like a, uh, you know, like a meal deal. Uh, this is like a combo. Are you ready? Uh, this is a McDavid combo. And he distributed to every one of Israel, both man and woman, to everyone. Here's what they get in their McDeal here: a loaf of bread, a piece of meat. Ah, yes, a nice piece of barbecued lamb. I'll go for it. And a cake of raisins. They even get dessert in this deal. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Everyone's just this delightful barbecue. This time with God is just sweet. Verse 4, and he appointed some of the Levites, that's the priests, right, to minister before the ark. They actually stand right there where the Ark of the Covenant is, in the tent of the Lord, to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. So uh, let me just uh, re-mention to us, I know you already know this, but in the New Testament, we're told that we are a royal priesthood, right? We're a royal priesthood unto the Lord, the priesthood of Jesus Christ. We follow right in line with, right in line with our priesthood through Christ Jesus. So we're all, in a sense, this new priesthood of the Lord. Well, what were these priests to do? They were given a three-part duty. Part number one, <laughs> commemorate. Let's talk about commemorate for just a moment. To commemorate in its simplest terms means to speak of or to talk about something in such a way that it brings people's memories back. Anybody who wants to be in ministry, anybody who wants to fulfill the priesthood that God has called each one of us to, we want you to know that you are to stand with God 
That's what the priests did, stood with the presence of God, and they first of all commemorated the Lord. That's where they talked about what the Lord, here's what the Lord's done, here's what the Lord's doing, here's what the Lord we hope will do in this new year. The second thing they did was to thank, or to be thankful. So of all people on the face of the earth, tell me who should be the most thankful? Christians. Gee, that's absolutely, huh? I mean, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you've noticed or thought of it lately, but what is it? This is the greatest hell you'll experience. This is it, right here. Isn't that sweet? Because God has heaven for you. Amen. Your citizenship is in heaven. <laughs> when it comes time to check out, as we all will, <laughs> you're going to check in to heaven. That's God's plan. So we should be thankful all the time for what God has done, for what God is doing. So commemorate, speak about God, remind others people of God. Number two, we're thankful to God. And then the last thing is we praise. Praise and worship to God is just who we are and what we do. Remember, we were created to praise. <coughs> we're, just, uh, we're just praising machines, if you will. Uh, but the problem is not all people praise God. So if you're not praising God, you're going to find something else to praise. <laughs> You know, be it yourself or, you know, some new car or a new house or a new person that you want in your life. So these are the three things. Commemorate, be thankful, and to praise God. Uh, verse 5. Asaph was the chief in charge of this group of people that was before the ark that commemorated, thanked, and praised God. You may remember Asaph. His name comes up a few times in the Psalms, doesn't it? It even appears as though perhaps David wrote some psalms without music and then presented the words to Asaph and then Asaph got his guys together and wrote the music. So he's listed there first as the chief one along with him, Zechariah, one of the priests. These are all Levites. Uh, then you can check down just a little bit in that same verse 5. There are stringed instruments and harps. But look at Asaph made music with what? The cymbals. <laughs> there you go, Rochelle. Hit those cymbals, you know, <laughs> like Asaph. You know, that's a beautiful thing. And then in verse 6, you can see uh, Benaniah and then another one of the priests. They regularly blew the trumpets before the Ark of the Covenant of God. I, I wanted to mention to you that I think this is one of the greatest days of David's life as well as one of the greatest days in the life of Israel. When the Ark of the Covenant came to Jerusalem and became once again the center of the people. Just as in our lives, the presence of God is to be at the center of our lives. And with that the case, it will change the way you speak and the way you act and the way you talk and the way you work the way you are at home, the way you are in relationships, the way you are with other people, because what's most central to you is having God at the very present and his presence at the very center of your life. So check this out. When David talks about himself, and uh, there is a prominent place in the scripture where David speaks of himself, uh, he doesn't of all the things David could say, you know, oh, you guys know me, don't you? I'm the one that uh, slew Goliath, you know. <laughs> or uh, David could say, yeah, you remember me. I was the one that they sang about when it said, uh, Saul has killed his thousands, but me, David, <laughs> I've killed the tens of thousands, you know. Or he could have said, uh, you know, hey, as far as a marksman with a sling, come on, you know. I, I would have an Olympic gold medal. Or he could say, I was a king. Or he could say, some people thought I was the greatest king. He doesn't mention any of that. When David speaks of himself, he refers only to this. And some have called me the sweet psalmist of Israel. What a claim to fame. The fact that this guy worshipped God. What a thing to want to be known for, even though he had an other string of great successes. And even though his kingdom under David grew from 6,000 square feet to 6,000 square feet. That's a pretty small kingdom, isn't it? That's about the size of my kingdom. Uh, uh, from, uh, it's not even that big. Uh, from 6 
thousand from six thousand square miles to sixty thousand right. square miles uh, under David. So he really had a lot to claim to claim fame to. So I think what David does then with these three things: commemorate, thank, and praise. I think what he does in the next verses, starting in verses seven through thirty-six, is he schools us in those three things. Well, how do you commemorate? How do you thank God? And how do you praise Him? And then David says, let me show you. This is how it's done. And what comes out of David, I believe, is just this kind of a spilling forward. Just a spilling out of thankfulness to God. Just, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's this a YouTube video that somebody sent me and uh, it's this uh, family and it's on Christmas and, and the dad comes in and tells the kids uh, oh, uh, I just thought I'd tell you what your uh, Christmas present is and the, kid, the kids are all you know the kids are like yeah what do you know what do you got what, what's the kid looks like the boy looks like he's about six or seven the girl looks like she's maybe 10 or 12 you know oh, yeah okay what's our Christmas present and then the dad goes we're going to Disneyland and the, and the kids just like they had takes them a second to, to register and then they go, and he goes and the one kid goes when and he goes right now we're going to Disneyland and the kid gets all excited we're going to Disneyland you know? <laughs> in praise of Disneyland <laughs> <laughs> but what we're to be like is we're going to go see the kings Amen. Amen. the king of kings and the lord of lords we're, we're going to be in his presence for all eternity we're going to party <laughs> Every tear wiped away, every sickness gone. <laughs> even we're gonna find out. Even the creation is gonna like sing to God. I can hardly wait to hear that. And I think that we, as God's people, let that in. Would you? Don't just receive it as a as some kind of a you know some kind of a fact in a book. <laughs> But let that seep into you. Because as that comes into you as a reality, what will come out of you is praise to God. What will happen to you is what God intended us to be like as his creation. Those that just, woo, let's let it go, you know. Just worship God. That's it. It's one of the reasons why worship is so central key to our fellowship as re really all of God's people back from the start praise has always been so huge now verse 7 says on that day David first delivered the song <coughs> to the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord so there's it right there they're commemorating God they're thanking the Lord and Asaph gets a hold of it sets some music to it and now they're going to praise the Lord with it uh, I want to tell you that <coughs> this psalm in this chapter is really a, uh, a mixture of where other psalms came from. So you can actually find parts of, but not the entirety, but parts of Psalm 105, uh, 96, uh, 48, <laughs> and 106 are all included in this parts of it are put together from here so i guess you'd call it a medley wouldn't you <laughs> a little bit of medley of uh, songs because that's what songs are our songs so he begins in verse eight and i think it's kind of a call to worship for all of us particularly the people in israel in uh, jerusalem at that time oh give thanks to the lord call upon his name Make known his deeds among the people. Isn't that commemorating? Right there? So David's showing us this is how it's done. Speak of his deeds. Talk about what God has done. Don't be quiet. You know, it, we're at a time right now where it seems, it feels as though Christians are becoming quieter and, 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 those anti-Christ forces are becoming louder. Uh, like, for instance, right now we're seeing a lot of uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, atheistic views and arguments in the culture. Uh, 
portrayed and brought forward and in movies and in TV and things like that, you know. You can't know. How can you know? Or it's dumb or it's little. Listen, we know. Hey, do you know that God's real? God's real. Does it matter what anybody said? Any, let God be true and everyone else a liar. So David says, make his deeds known. Even the billboards, the atheist billboards we had here on Beach Boulevard, right here in Orange County. Verse 9 continues. Sing to him. Sing songs to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of, of those rejoice who seek the Lord. You know, uh, another thing that we see a lot of right now, which is it seems to be like super popular, is uh, anybody, any place, anytime slamming the name of Jesus. Don't you see it? You see it on television now. <clears throat> Everybody, they walk around and, and, they, and they, it's like a thing of prominence, Jesus. And they're saying it disrespectfully. Oh, Jesus, you know, uh, OMG, you know. It's like, wait a minute here. But, and that seems to be all okay. It's okay as long as you're putting Jesus down to say the name of Jesus. But if you say his name in a prayer, or if you say his name with reverence, then what happens? It's like, you're the oddball. You're the square. There's something wrong with you, you know? Well, up is down and down is up. Is, it, is that something that's going to be portrayed by end times? So then, then surely we're there. Verse 11, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. And only Christians can seek his face <coughs> evermore. These are marvelous instructions. Let me tell you this. If you're feeling down ever, anytime, wherever, however, <laughs> if you're feeling low, if you're feeling spiritually attacked, or if you're feeling distant from the Lord, then I say open up <laughs> to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And read verses 8 through 36. And just see what happens to your soul. See that you don't know that you're encouraged. Watch how your heart is lifted just as you read these verses. Verse 12. Remember his marvelous works which he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. So we're told here, verse 11, seek the Lord. Verse 12, remember the Lord and what he has done. Verse 13, O seed of Israel, his servant. Boy, Israel's kind of forgotten that today, haven't they? That they're his servant. You children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Now, I think that this is put in here, and it feels like it's put in here very prominently. And the reason why is something that I'll remind us as we continue through Chronicles, first and second, is this is being given to a group of people who are returning to the promised land. Vast majority of them, even though they're small in number, but the vast majority of them have never seen Israel. They were born in Babylon. <laughs> they were born in Persian captivity, you know. So they're coming back into the land... There's a few people there, none of them Jews. They were all transported in there, if you'll recall. And so they're coming into the land, and the Holy Spirit has picked out certain things, not everything, certain things in order to remind them how to get established, how they're to operate, what things God has done in the past. And so that's kind of the things that's going here. I believe this also fits well if anybody's been a prodigal. Or if anybody wants a revival in their life, here it is. Do what this says, and you'll have a revival in your life. Verse 14, <clears throat> he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Bible commentator Meyer wrote the following, talking of all his wondrous works. Quote, we do not talk sufficiently about God. Why is it so many, so, why is it so, <laughs> may not be easy to explain, but there seems to be too great resonance among Christian people about the best things. We talk about sermons, details of 
worship and church organization or the latest phase of scriptural criticism. We may discuss men, methods, fellowships, but our talk in the home and in the gatherings of Christians for social purposes is too seldom about the wonderful works of God. Better to speak less and to talk more of Him. Is that right, on? He nailed that one good. Verse 15, remember His covenant forever. The word which He commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant which He made with Abraham. Remember, these people are coming back into the land. And a people coming back into the land, he goes, Hey, remember the covenant with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute for Israel for an everlasting covenant. Uh, for an everlasting covenant. That's kind of interesting, huh? Uh, so if there's a UN resolution that says Israel's to be dissolved or to cut up, what do you think about that? <laughs> what do you think God thinks about that? <laughs> you think God pays any attention to UN resolutions? I don't think so. Do you th what about if the White House says, let's draw some lines here in Israel and chop it up? Let's make it two states. <laughs> Oops. Hey, listen, there's plenty of people who believe, and I'm right with them, that the reason why the United States says continued in blessing is because we're blessing Israel. And how soon are we, how close are we now to stopping that? Well, I'd be afraid of that, you know. I'm very afraid of that. Lord have mercy on us. So, uh, here then is God's word to Israel. And, and, and God speaks in a timeless manner. So, so United Nations or, uh, you know, Islamic Brotherhood or Iran or Iraq or whoever. Here's God's word. Here's what God says, saying... To you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment for your inheritance. <laughs> That's the final analysis right there. And anybody then who would argue with this is arguing with God. Your argument's not with <coughs> man. <laughs> your argument is with God. Verse 19, when you were few in number... Indeed, very few and strangers in it. So remember, God brings Abraham into the promised land, Canaan. And he says, Abraham, look around. <laughs> look as far as you can see. It's all yours and your descendants. I will give this land. Verse 20. When they, uh, when they went from one nation to another, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. So God has supernaturally protected the nation of Israel, and this tells us that he intends to continue to do that. Verse 23, Sing to the Lord all earth, all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. There's your marching orders, church family. Verse 23. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim the good news <laughs> of his salvation from day to day. Verse 24. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. You like that one, Aileen? Yeah. Yeah. That's what you want to oh. do. <laughs> Missions trip. Go into all the world. That's right. Verse uh, 25, right? Uh -huh. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. Now look, a lot of people talk about a lot of gods. But here it says that God is to be feared above all gods. Why would that be? Well, verse 26 answers that question. For all the gods of the people are idols. <laughs> you know, what's wood? or a lump of stone or whatever somebody may worship. It's not the one true God. But the Lord made the heavens. Boy, don't you just want to put that verse up in our schools? Very unpopular to say God created. But here it is right here. God made the heavens. 
Don't you feel, I feel like, you know, sorry, Lord, that there are so many people who don't recognize what you've done. But I've recognized what you've done. Don't you love a beautiful sunset or a beautiful sunrise? It, some of you get up for sunrises? <laughs> Tell me about it, would you? <laughs> Take a picture. <laughs> God created everything from nothing. Mm -hmm. It's not evolution and it's not aliens. <laughs> Verse 27. Honor the majesty, honor and, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. That's for sure, huh? Mm -hmm. Thinking of the angels in heaven. Verse 28. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. See, that talks about serving him, doesn't it? I give him glory because he's God. I worship you, Lord. I give you glory. I praise your name. I speak of you. I thank you. But I also give him whatever strength I have. My strength is yours, Lord. Use me how you would. Verse 29, give to the Lord glory. Do his name. Bring an offering. And come before him. Oh, worship the Lord. Catch this. In the beauty of holiness. See, we're, we're, our culture is becoming very, very base. Uh, very, very quickly. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, the vast majority of humor used today in our culture, most of it's potty humor, isn't it? Or very, very sarcastic. Always going for the most base thing and the lower thing. And then if somebody goes to some new low, then somebody else comes around and does what? Goes to a lower low, trying to top their low. That's, that's comedy today. <laughs> that's entertainment. But for the Christian, true beauty to the Christian is holiness. The world goes, holiness? Oh, that's so boring. That's so, you know, that's the, you know. Holiness, why would you go after that? Look, the Bible says that holiness is beauty. If you read through the scriptures, you find out that holiness is happiness. Oh my gosh, the sorrows that we would never experience if we would live the life that God has called us to live. Holiness is beauty because holiness is Jesus. Nobody lived holiness to its fullest except for Christ. And so anytime you want to know what holiness looks like, you look at how Jesus lived and how he spoke and his words give hope and his words bring healing and his words bring life and his words bring us to the place of greatest value and meaning in life. The beauty of holiness. Holiness, of course, means to be set aside for God's purposes. That's what it means. I'm all yours, Lord, like in consecration. Verse 30, tremble. Another translation of that says fear. Fear before him, all the earth. The world also is firmly established and shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Oh, that's nice. The Lord, our God reigns. Amen? Amen. Let the sea roar and let and all its fullness. Let the field rejoice and all that is in it. Then the trees of the woods shall rejoice before the Lord. For, that's a reason word, isn't it? <laughs> Give some information and you say for, it's a reason word. For, he is coming to judge the earth. It would seem to me like creation is looking forward to God's judgment. And you find the reason for that and the answer for that in uh, Romans chapter 8, where Paul the Apostle says that creation's like a tiptoe, <clears throat> waiting to be released, the shackles of sin even coming off of creation. <clears throat> it's going to be awesome. So, so there you have the, the trees, they're like, they're like, come on, Jesus! You know? 
quick before I fall over, you know? So they're wanting the Lord to come back, and then I don't know what the tree... There's even one song that says, uh, the trees of the field show clap their hands at Christ coming back, you know? See these branches go... <laughs> I don't know, but they're going to be happy. All of God's creation is going to be happy, and we'll be right back where he intended it to be. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, verse 34, for his mercy endures forever. Is that where we're at? Yep. And say, save us, O God of our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles, those folks that don't know God, right? That's really what he's speaking of, and their enemies, because we Gentiles who believe have now been grafted in, right? Okay. But let me back up there to the start of 35. Save us, O God, of our salvation. Come on. Do anybody remember where they've heard something like that before? Where? Hosanna. Hosanna. You got it, Mike. <laughs> this is like Palm Sunday. Because Hosanna means save now. Save now. Hosanna, O God of our salvation. This is just pointed right towards Christ. He's the one that can do these things. Then uh, down in verse 35, towards the end, to give thanks to your holy name, to uh, triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. <coughs> Check this out. And all the people said? Amen. <laughs> Good one, huh? You thought some preacher somewhere made that up, didn't you? It's right here in the Bible. Preacher David made that up. And all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. This was like the perfect day. This was like <laughs> this was like the perfect day in Israel. You know? If we had the Wayback Machine and uh, could go travel back in time, surely you would want to show up on a day like this. David bless the people. You get the little meal lunch handout. I mean, you know, you're here with ASAP and the first string musicians playing, you know. I mean, this must have been something. Thank you, Lord. Verse 37. And this is following this. So he left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister before the Ark regularly as every day's work required. So Obed-Edom, uh, with his 68 brethren, including Obed-Edom, the son of uh, Jeduthun, and Hosa, to be gatekeepers, and Zadok, the priest, and his brethren and priests, before the tabernacle of the Lord at the high place, which was at Gibeon. Okay, check this out, so what it's saying. Okay. Uh, David brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Then your next question might be, what happened to the old uh, tabernacle? You know, remember with the four curtains over the top and all the slats and exactly put together to dimension? Not only that, but hey, where's the table of showbread? Where's the uh, seven candlesticks? Uh, what else? Did I miss any piece of furniture there? Where's the uh, altar of incense? That's right. Where are they? They're not there. They're here at this place called Gibeon. But it's isn't it interesting? I, I, I like David's, uh, if you will, I like his priorities. Because all these other items are Gibeon, the one item that he goes after is what? The ark. The ark. That which symbolized the presence of God, the speaking of God, the light of God, you know, the direction of God. So David has priorities, but he still gives uh, preference to both, service at both sides. <coughs> 40, to burn offerings to the Lord on a regular altar of burnt offerings regularly, morning and evening they had offerings. Interesting, huh? I think we should give the Lord the due morning and evening. There was a, 
I was at Teen Challenge yesterday morning. It went awesome. God was with us. There was some spiritual battle, but the Lord was able to get us through it. And that's five or six guys gave their life to the Lord. Just an awesome time. Just beautiful worship. You know, it's a blessing to be there. But uh, Greg was up there, and he was he was saying. Uh, because I learned this from Pastor Paul, and Pastor Paul has learned this from somebody else. I can't remember who, but he said, uh, he said, uh, I'm doing something now every morning that is really changing my day. And he goes, what I do every morning now is the first thing I, when I wake up, and this is what I personally do, I try that my very first thought, if I can catch my very first thought, I say, good morning, Heavenly Father. So Greg said he started doing that, and it's now beginning to change his day. If you can catch that first thought, give it to the Lord, give his due, because what follows that then is what's on your heart before the Lord. Because right after I say, good morning, Heavenly Father, then I say, oh, Lord, be with me today. Help me to do what you want me to do. Help me not to squander this day, but to use it for your glory. Bless my brothers and sisters, family. Bless my kids. In Jesus' name. Then you're ready to go, you know. So, uh, all right, I don't even know why I said that. Verse 41. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> is that where we're at? And with them, he man, real strong guy, <laughs> and Judithan and the rest who were chosen, who were designated by name to give thanks to the Lord, because his mercy endures forever. Designated by name. Isn't that awesome again? God knows your name. He knows where he wants to put you. And with them, uh, Heman and Juduthan, the sound to sound aloud with trumpets and cymbals, and check this out, the musical instruments of God. I don't know. I just like the way that sounds. <laughs> the musical instruments of God. I, uh, I I I have we we've had one guitar that was uh, donated to the church, but when it was donated to the church, the guy who donated to the church said, uh, I will give this to the church, but you have to promise me that this guitar will be dedicated to the Lord and not used for any other purposes. Which was easy for me to do. I said, absolutely. <laughs> then somebody wanted to borrow the guitar one time, and I said, oh, look, I can let you borrow it, but listen, when this was donated, you can only use it to, to bring glory to God and, and uh, for godly purposes. And guess what? He didn't borrow it. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was smart of him, actually. Verse 43. And all the people departed, every man to his house, and David, re and David returned to bless his house. Again, a wonderful time, wonderful passage. I'll bet we can do this. First Chronicles 17. Let's go, go, go. <laughs> now it came to pass when David was dwelling in his house. We don't know what long a period of time happened between uh, the Ark of the Covenant coming in uh, chapter 16 and then this here in chapter 17. But at some time has passed, things are going along, David's in his house, dwelling in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet became one of David's closest counselors. So David says to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar. No moths. <laughs> Probably smell. Yeah, anybody here have any cedar closet or anything? <laughs> They're nice, aren't they? Beautiful smell. Yeah. I think I remember one of my grandparents having a cedar chest or something like that. And when you open that thing up, it's like, phew, the smell comes right out of you, doesn't it? It's kind of beautiful. So David's living in a cedar house. Uh, remember that one king Hiram from the north sent him all the, the wood to do this. So he's like, man, I, I've got a pretty slick hat series, you know, thinking. It says, but the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is under a tent, is under tent curtains. So this is kind of like uh, David has one of these aha moments where he's walking around his beautiful house. It's a palace, actually. He looks across and he sees the tent that the Ark of the Covenant. And David kind of, I think in his own heart, goes, what's wrong with this picture? You know? Well, something's not right here. This, this is not right. Verse 2, Then Nathan said to David, 
Do all that is in your heart, for God is with you. See, I'm thinking that Nathan the prophet has been watching David. And Nathan looks at David's attitude. And David is saying, man, God's house should be nicer than my house, you know. I shouldn't have the nicest house in the block. That should belong to the Lord. So he's like, no doubt that David loves the Lord. I think Nathan singing, David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. How awesome. All this praise is going on all the time on account of David. David has geared up the priests, and I can smell now the morning and the evening sacrifices. He's reading the word to find out the proper order of things. So when David comes across with this, I want to build something for God, Nathan just goes, right on, David, go for it. But does this remind you of anything? Isn't this kind of like David saying, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant here? That's a good idea. It's a right thing to do. But he didn't consult with God first. Isn't that what Nathan should have done? Does this tell us that sometimes even if you have a good idea, don't just go do it. Pray about it first. Ask the Lord. Let's see what happens next. Verse 3. But it happened that night, the Lord doesn't waste any time, that the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, <clears throat> Excuse me, Nate. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in. Nathan had told David, if you look back at verse 2 at the end, it says, God is with you. Now, we have no doubts that God is with David, do we? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty clear every way you view it, that God is with David. But that doesn't mean that David was the one to build the temple. Now, we will find that to build the temple is in the heart of God. And indeed, God will end up giving instructions on how it is to be built. But it's not David's assignment. The assignment belongs to somebody else. See, we each have assignments. And you're not to do my assignments. And I am not to do your assignments. They're yours. Once you come to a personal connection and love with Jesus Christ, Believe me, I think one of the biggest things on the list is for you to find out what your assignments are. And that can only be found by day-to-day -day walking with Christ. And as you are day-to-day -day walking with Christ, your assignments will be made obvious. Because, as we learn in Ephesians chapter 2, <coughs> God has actually prepared good works for us to do beforehand somewhere before you were born before the world began God sat there with Willis and said I'm going to have Willis do this this and this and I'm going to have Paul do this this and this and I'm going to have David do this this and this but I'm not going to have him build the temple we find other place that David is a man of war we know that and David's hands are bloody from war and God doesn't want the temple associated with bloody from war. So that's one of the reasons why he tells David, it's not your assignment. Verse, four, verse 5, God continues. For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day, but have gone from tent to tent, <laughs> and from one tabernacle to another. It's almost like God is saying here, hey, you haven't heard me complain, have you? <laughs> I'm not complaining. I'm willing to do this. I just want to be with you. Verse 6, check this out. God says, Wherever I have moved about with all Israel. See, it's almost like God is saying, Every place they walked, I was walking with them. Notice that? How God puts himself right in the sea, not distant, far away someplace, but right there riding in the car with you. Right there at your desk at work or at school. Right there, you know, with you all the way. God says, 
wherever I've moved about, isn't God everywhere? <laughs> or doesn't he sit in heaven? Or, wait a minute. He's saying this once again, that he's right with us in the doctor's office or wherever the case may be. Wherever I have moved about with all Israel, have I ever spoken a word? Notice God even sends them back to his word. To any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, say, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? <laughs> Can anybody, God say, remember me ever saying something like that? <laughs> the Lord's telling David, I've had many opportunities to ask a number of people to do this uh, temple thing, and have I done it? Have you heard me say anything? Verse 7, Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be a ruler over my people Israel. All right, this is great. Uh, yes, David is being turned down to build a temple, but look what the Lord does. He puts before him, this is what you will do, or this is what your life is meant to be. Your life is not meant to be that, the building of the temple. Your life is meant to be this. And notice how the Lord says, I took you. What's the lowest job in Israel? Shepherd. 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 <clears throat> I took you from the lowest job that there is, and this is what I've done with you. It wasn't you who did it, God is saying. I'm the one who did this. Verse 8, and have I been with you? Wherever you have gone, this is like, isn't that like a huge point with the Lord? Surely I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He's called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not distant, but right here, listening to us tonight, sitting next to you. Wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. <laughs> and have made you a name like the name of great men who are on the earth. Well, we read that and all we can say to verse 8 in regards to God and David is amen. He sure has done. He did exactly that. 7 and 8, David. Absolutely. Moreover, God says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. This is what I said. And I will plant them. That's uh, Israel and Jerusalem that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previous. And we say to that again, amen. That's just what you were doing through David. And we need to take note, again, that from time to time we may come up with a good idea of some good thing to do. Or somehow we think that God should be using us and our abilities and our ministry and our time and our efforts, and God will say, no. I want to be a minister. God says, no. I want to be a worship leader. God says, no. I want to teach. God maybe says, no. Listen, here's the question. Can we let God say no to us at any time when... We want to do a good thing, even. Are you up for God saying no? I guess that's the question. You want to be a missionary and it isn't happening? Then support a missionary. You want to be a minister and the Lord has said no to you? Support those who the Lord has said yes to. Here's what Meyer said. If you cannot have what you hoped do not sit down in despair and allow the energies of your life to run to waste. But arise and gird yourself to help others to achieve. If you may not build, you may gather materials for him that shall. If you may not go down to the mine, you can hold the ropes. Amen. Verse 10, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, also, uh, over my people Israel, also I will subdue all your enemies. <clears throat> Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house. Check this out. David goes to God, can I build you a house? What does God say? 
no, you can't build me a house. I'm going to build you a house. Isn't God, look, as far as people who know how to say no, <laughs> God's the best knower sayer there is, right? <laughs> He's the greatest at saying no. David, I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty. Descendants that will be kings. Here is what is true for all of us. It is all about what God has done for us and not about what we can do for him. And I have seen people over the years who have walked away from the church or walked away from ministry because God has not allowed them to do it their way. And because God has said no to them, they get all pouty and they do nothing. Or worse, they do damage to what God has given them to do. We have to let God say no. Verse 11, and it shall be when your days are fulfilled. What's he talking about? He's talking to David. He says, David, when you come to the end of the line, look, I hate to say this, remind you all of it. Nobody likes to be reminded of it. We're all, unless the Lord comes back before our time is up, we're all going to go, aren't we? I've been in a lot of deathbeds, I have to say. <coughs> and it's interesting that when it comes to the very end, uh, it seems like, uh, you know, I'm, just, I'm trying to be honest with you now. All the person has is what sits on top of that little, you know, that tray thing that rolls out from the bed, you know. That's it. And they got a sheet on top and a sheet underneath. That's it. And what will happen or what's of value or what's of importance right then is not what you have owned in life or not what you have done, but what God's will has been able to move in your life with freedom. And I've seen, I've been in hospital rooms where people have gone. It's interesting because I've, I've watched it now. The family then, they just don't know what to do. They'll usually walk over to the little table and they'll put everything in a box. And there they stand. With a, there's usually a brush and a Bible, and uh, isn't that right, Mike? How many times have we seen it now? Everybody's very quiet. Because what's of value? What makes your life of meaning is your connection with God. So when God speaks to David, he knows when David's last breath is going to be. And he says, look, David, when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, here's the promise. Hang on to your hats because you're going to see Jesus all over the place in one second here. That I will set up your seed after you who will be of your sons. At this point, David has no sons. And I will establish his kingdom. He's speaking of some son, some future son coming from David who's going to have an established <coughs> kingdom. He shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. Now some people say, oh, well, that's Solomon. I don't think so. What do you think? Does Solomon have a throne forever? It kind of throws Solomon out of the running, doesn't it? <laughs> he is looking past Solomon to the not yet born Jesus Christ, who is called the Son of David, the Messiah. Verse 13, I will be his father. And he shall be my son. And I will not take mercy away from him. Is it Jesus rich in mercy towards us? Didn't he bring mercy from the Father? As I took it from him who was before you. Speaking of Saul. Saul uh, went a little too far, didn't he? Verse 14. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established. What's that last word? Forever. Forever. Now, was Solomon's throne established forever? 
See, you got to kind of like weed through this. This is Jesus right here in the pages of Chronicles. This is the promise we all cling to. This is our Jesus. And I'm telling you, if you can see this, if you can grasp this, then I want to let you know that flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, let me give you, here's what the angel said, Luke chapter 1, verse 32. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Speaking of Emmanuel. Here's what Jesus says in Revelation 22, 16. Gives it away. Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David. I'm the one that they're speaking of back here. I'm the root and the offspring of David. The bright and morning star. Revelation 22, 16. Verse 15. According to all these words and according to all this wisdom, so Nathan spoke to David. Good job, Nathan. You gave it all to David as you should have. What's David's response? Verse 16. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> we all need to do that, don't we? <laughs> when God says no, what do you do? Go sit with him. <laughs> and he said... Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet, this was a small thing in your sight, O God, and you have also spoken to your servant's house for a great while to come, and have regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree, O Lord God." This attitude is what makes David great. His total humility before God. <laughs> that God should let us do anything. What do I have to, to show God for reason or cause to use me for his glory? What bragging rights do I have before a holy God? Anything God lets me do, I'm like, him, him, hooray! Even if it seems like the smallest thing, it was my assignment, and I did it. Who am I, God, that you should call my name and use me for your purposes? Verse 18, what more can David say to you for the honor of your servants? For you know your servant. <laughs> David says, Lord, you know how to say no to me. <laughs> O oh Lord, verse 19, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart. Oh, I love this. You have done all this greatness in making known all these great things. O oh Lord, there is none like you, nor is there any God beside you. According to all that we have heard with our ears, and who is like your people Israel? The one nation on earth whom God went to redeem for himself as a people. To make for yourself a name by great and awesome deeds. By driving out nations from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. And you, Lord, have become their God. And now, O oh Lord... The word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, let it be established forever. And do as you have said. See, can you see David just like so in love with the Lord? And he just he just pours out his heart. Now you have the very same God and the very <coughs> same heritage as David. You can say the same prayer that David prays. And then tag on to the end of it. Lord God, you have made me an usher. Lord God, you have put me in hospitality. You, O oh God, who's created all things and done these marvelous acts and saved me from destruction and plugged me into your people Israel. You, O oh God, are great who is like you. And you have remembered the low regard of your servant. Who am I and who is my house that you should call my name and use me to proclaim your goodness among the people? It's the same. Hallelujah. Verse 24. So let it be established that your name may be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, is Israel's God, 
and let the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O oh my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. <laughs> Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, you are God and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I, I just want to say from my heart, and I believe the hearts of the church family here, Lord, we, we love your nose. I ask that you forgive me, Father, for any time you said no and I didn't like it. I wasn't being very smart. I know, Lord, that your will is good and it is right. And, Lord, I gladly take the no's of my life and I offer them up upon, you know, I bring you all my plans. Gladly I bring you my plans. And ask that if they don't line up with your plans, that you make them burnt offerings. Just remove any, anything other than you and your thoughts from my mind, Lord. For anything other than your perfect will is at best, second best. I want your best, Lord. This church family wants your best. These people want your best. Who are we, Lord God? that you should have picked us to be your servants. And now, Lord God, let us and let our hearts be established before you forever. For you are our God. And we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Everybody says, Amen. let's stand up as we close in worship. <clears throat>